Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. We say often here at TPC, we love the sound of greeting and people chatting with one another. It's a sign of good health. And so here you uh, socializing and greeting one another is a good sound to hear in God's house. Amen. I'm Pastor Peter Ruel, pastor of TPC, and we just want to welcome you here as friends and family of the Glodes. And uh, as they walk through this journey of uh, Ken's departure, as uh, Father Pierre and I just engaged uh, greetings, we talked about the fact that uh, it's heaven's gain and our loss and the, vo the void and the vacancy that we feel. Just a few moments ago, as you were coming in, you may have seen a lot of photos uh, going through, and I believe those to be Ken's photos. Ken loved to take his camera and take his drive to Monteith every day, and uh, I'd ask Joanna, when does he come home? And she said, well, it depends on how many pictures he takes on the way home. And, uh, but we had a conversation yesterday. Uh, later on, you'll meet uh, Pastor Grimes who has been, come, has been invited to come as the, by the family to share today. And uh, we talked yesterday about uh, a glimpse of heaven. We really can't compare. And uh, I want to read for you today because Ken was a preacher. Ken was a teacher. He loved the Word of God, and he loved to study the Word of God and share the Word of God. And so it would be pertinent for us to start our service today in his honor and the honor of his Savior, Jesus, by reading the Word of God. A very familiar portion of scripture at this time would be John 14, and I'll read that in a moment. But maybe not a familiar portion of scripture would be Revelations chapter 14. Revelation 14 and John 14, just one verse and a few verses in 14. Revelations 14 verse 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit. They are blessed indeed. They will rest from their hard work, and their good deeds will follow them. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There are many. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have not told you? I am going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will be with me forever. For where I am, you will be also. The promise of God's word. Really, today we're at a doorway. Ken is on the other side of that doorway. We're still on this side of this doorway. And we imagine what it's like on the other side of the door. But Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And Ken is seeing what's on the other side of that door today. And uh, we trust that uh, you will be encouraged today as we honor the legacy of Pastor Ken Glode and honor the deposit that he's made in our lives. But truly, uh, we need to see Jesus in this moment as well, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is Ken's assurance and Ken's certainty of eternal life and can be yours as well. And you'll hear about that today. You'll hear about Ken, Pastor Ken, but you'll also hear about Jesus. Amen. Let's just pray as we start our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the promise of your comfort, specifically for Joanna today. Lord, many of us in this room have relationship with Ken Glode. Lord, many of us know him as friend. We know him as pastor. Lord, some know him as dad. Some know him as grandpa. But only one person in this room knows him as hubby, and that's Joanna. And so we just pray for her today, Lord, and her family that you would be the comfort that you promised to be, as you have been in these days, these moments, these weeks, to this moment, and you promise to as the days proceed. So we thank you for friends and family who have come to share their support and, Lord, their love for Pastor Ken, for Joanna, for the family. Have your way amongst us. Be glorified in our time together again today, we pray. It's in your name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. So if you take a look at the screen, you will have a video memory of Pastor Ken Glode.
One of the things that's uh, common in all those photos, I don't know if you noticed, the uh, attire has changed. The width ties and the, that one shirt there that he had was really something. The attire changes, but the facial smile 
It was constant in every one of those pictures. And so we're just thankful for the smile that Ken has made in our lives. And that is really due to his Lord and Savior. And uh, before we invite uh, individuals to come and give tribute, I think of another smile in the house today, and that's a smile of Pastor Paul Douglas. And so we just want to acknowledge his presence in the house today. And thank you for your friendship. So starting off our tributes today, and we'll just ask those who are sharing today just to follow the bulletin and to come up one after the other, if you wouldn't mind. But we'll start with Wade Adams, who is Monteith Correctional Complex Duty Superintendent. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, will, I will get there. Do, do, um, do you want to introduce yourself? One little brief thing. Um, as far as uh, I am relatively new to Monteith, uh, but my short time there um, was definitely met with Ken a few times. Um, he, uh, I was just talking to his to Heather there a few minutes ago, and she was right. When every conversation I ended, he had me thinking, wait, <laughs> there's something now I gotta go look, I gotta go, I gotta go look up um, or think about. Um, so he touched everybody there. I can't, uh, my condolences again to the family. Um, I don't, I don't believe Monteith was a place of work for Ken. I think it was just a stopping point on his day. As you see by a, a lot of these pictures that are up and around, he took a few of them on the plate on his way in to uh, into the facility, and a few on the way home. Um, so again, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Um, <laughs> my condolences to the family. Okay. So I'm Natalie. I'm a program supervisor at Monteith. Um, I initially, when I started working with Ken, I was a social worker. Um, so in 1999, um, Ken became a duty chaplain at Monteith. Everyone at Monteith has known Ken, uh, Reverend Ken Glode as Ken, Ken Glode, the chaplain. Um, so today we gather to celebrate and honor the life of Ken Glode. So he was a beacon of light at Monteith throughout the years from 1999 to 2023, so 24 years debt of dedicated service. Ken not only important valuable spiritual lessons to strengthen the inmates' faith, but he was a dear friend to many who have worked with him for years, over the years. According to, to his wife, Joanna, uh, Reverend Ken was preparing sermons right up to a month before his passing on September 8, 2023. That's how devoted and dedicated he was. While serving at, at Monteith, uh, Ren, Ren, Clote, uh, Ren Ken provided regular pastoral duties, religious, spiritual faith services, and care to inmates in the correction division and jail, as well as providing counseling, grief counseling, Bible studies, delivered mandatory ministry programs, which he delivered with his own dynamic and entertaining style for the inmates. He balanced rehabilitative and faith programs. With more intensive discharge plans, Reverend Ken has been resourceful, in maximizing assistance for clothing and hygiene kits on release, donations from the Salvation Army, local churches. Chaplain Ken would also work everywhere, but he chose to work with inmates and with the most challenging population. He was never condescending to inmates or staff, never painting himself as a savior, but reached out to people who were struggling. He was compassionate to those who were facing tough times while serving their time in custody. He was approachable, devoted, soft-spoken, spoken from the heart, and in language that inmates could understand. He did not discriminate and offered his services to inmates on div of diverse faith and ethnicity. He was a strong advocate for diversity. He prided himself in addressing a holistic approach with inmates. He had a presence of serenity, calmness, was forgiving, and he was very humble. During tough and challenging situations, 
he demonstrated great restraint, personal strength, and patience. He kept functioning and responding constructively despite ongoing stresses and maintained a high standard of performance. He presented a high level of professionalism, dedication, devotion, loyalty to his ministry that was commendable. Ken was thanks for his guidance and sharing of his knowledge. He had at times provided spiritual care for those admitted to healthcare facility. He toured the special management units at Monteith to make sure the needs were met. He endeavors the inmates to maintain a connection between them and their children. Every year, he partnered with the Angel Tree Christmas Prison Fellowship and local church communities to provide inmates a chance to give their children a gift to let them know they're not forgotten. Christmas cards were also provided to the inmates' loved ones. In the spring months, he would have children of incarcerated parents participate to summer camps. He received a local and regional award for his exceptional efforts in the Angel Tree, Christmas Tree and Summer Camp programs. He has touched the lives and spirits of many children of incarcerated parents. Over the years, Reverend Ken did more than his job required. He also worked closely with Reverend Frank Liu, Provincial Chaplaincy Coordinator, Daryl Pettifer, Deputy Administration, who at the time, he's now superintendent, social workers, correctional officers, teachers, sergeants, NILOs, volunteers. Uh, he developed and maintained relationships with community multi-faith leaders and various multi-faith councils, committees, organizations, with continuous recruits, so volunteers like Jackie Weiss. Uh, he also brought back the AANA volunteers, Father Pierre, Kennebec volunteers. He did their orientations. He did the operations, uh, routines. He also facilitated <clears throat> yearly volunteer banquets. However, since the COVID we, uh, restrictions, we weren't able to do that. He also uh, baptized, there was bap two baptism of two inmates that took place at Monteith. Uh, which was which was a first. So on March 12, 2023, uh, Reverend Ken also was praised for on behalf of the Monterey Multi Faith Counselor Spiritual and Religion Care uh, for again for spiritual and religious care at Monteith. I remember many times uh, when Reverend Ken dropped my off by my office as a, when I was a social worker. He would drop by for five minutes. And either we would talk about inmates maybe we had in common, the tricks that SEALs would play on him, like hiding his television remote controls, <laughs> and talk about his personal life, and or pictures he had taken of animals, he, of the northern wildlife he had taken, captured with his camera, on his way to work or on his way home. He shared this wonderful hobby and generously shared pictures of ducks, loons, blue herons, bears, moose. Often I would tell him, this you should share with Docs Unlimited, as this would make a beautiful print for the world to see. Monteith Nilo shared a special bond with, with Reverend Ken. One of the Nilo shared that he was their go-to person. He had been at Monteith for a long time and shared advice about life in general, work, and believed that he had a lot of wisdom. Reverend Ken would also visit the Nilo every morning with his tea, coffee, and a snack, and he would also share lunch with them on a daily basis. They described him to be funny, caring, and such a storyteller. <laughs> All three Nilos believe that one morning, Reverend Ken would surprise them with his presence and come back to Monteith because Reverend Ken felt that he had not done all he wanted to do at Monteith. According to one of the teach school teachers, because we do have two school teachers, Ken would drop by the office when you needed it most. Without you knowing it, this is how observant Ken was. He would share about himself all the time. His presence, is, his presence is missed. Also, inmates would make him a get well card for him, and, and they would ask often about how he is doing. The history among countless others highlights the profound impact Reverend Ken has had on many lives, both spiritually and personally. His teachings will forever remain etched in the, in the inmates' hearts and minds, guiding them as they continue in their walk of faith. Some of his teachings will also remain with many that interacted with him at Monteith. 
when I first learned of, of Reverend Ken being ill or and being at the hospital and in poor health, I made plans to visit him, and so did, did others at Monteith on a few occasions. This gave me the opportunity to meet with his wife, Joanna, and, and his son, and also so Christian, and I certainly have met Heather today. Um, so, of course, uh, Christian could be Ken's twin. <laughs> Losing a beloved chaplain here at Monteith is a profound and sorrowful experience. A chaplain, like any spiritual leader, leaves a lasting impact not only on the inmates, but on everyone that has contact with him. He has guided and nurtured inmates through countless chapels and left his, in his imprint at Monteith. During his 24 years of service, uh, Reverend Ken provided support, guidance for both the younger and older generations of different multiple face, faiths. For this and the many other ways, Reverend Ken served us with unwavering love, commitment, and we express our deepest gratitude. Ken's passing is not only a time to mourn, but also an opportunity to celebrate the influence he has had and at a time to commemorate his life and achievements on his great generosity. I, I wish to share a few final words. So the life given to us by nature is short, but the memory of a life well spent is eternal. Cicero, the comfort of having a friend may be taken away, but not that of having one. Seneca, Roman Stoic philosopher. Again, our deepest sympathies to Joanna and, her, and, and the family. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Frank Lu. I, I started in the ministry. I don't have as much years of experience in Ontario Corrections as Ken. I first spoke with Ken in 2017. And as my personality, I like to pick on the older folks because I can draw a lot of wisdom. So I tried to challenge him on marriage. When he was coming to the conference last year, I said, Ken? Um, so he said he was gonna come with his wife. I said, so you listen to the wife, you take the wife everywhere you go. He said, yes. I said, so you're kind of whipped. He says, Frank, which married man isn't? <laughs> so I decided I wasn't going to challenge him on marriage. I decided I was going to challenge him on programs. I said, Ken, you're running this program and um, it is not faith-based and I'm, you know, trying to convince him. And he listened to me and then he said, Frank, I make it what it is. A little of me have to be in the programs that I run for the people I love and that was the inmates. I know he loved photography, but I believe he loved people more. And that was very, very evident. Ken was my advisor my um, my friend, because of his years of experience, I call him often and we talked about work. I've only been in this position for just over two years and I've learned a lot from Ken. He was avid about his work in chaplaincy. Last year, I was desperate because I was looking for someone to do, we, we were putting on a chaplain's conference and I wanted someone to do the indigenous blessing. And Ken said, didn't you know I was indigenous? <laughs> and I said, yes, but I didn't know if you would be okay doing it. He said, certainly I would. No, I don't know if his family would agree with me here, but I found Ken to be soft-spoken. Um, he wasn't stubborn, but he was very determined. So we are not gonna say stubborn, we'll say determined, that's a better word. And so, when Ken came up to do the indigenous blessing, the, solicitor, the deputy solicitor general was there. When he opened his mouth, um, it wasn't Ken. Once he assumed this role where he was speaking to the public, this wasn't soft-spoken Ken. There was someone else that was coming out. And um, some of the other um, PAOC chaplains um, who are credentialed by PAOC, um, they're like, yeah, that's Ken when he preaches. 
He's not the soft. He just had this way of commanding the room. The DSG was so touched, um, the Deputy Solicitor General, that she, she wiped a tear from her eye and she came up and she mentioned to him how grateful she was because he also did the land acknowledgement. This year at the conference, when she spoke, she gave a tribute to Ken and she said she would always remember what, what he had said about the indigenous people and also about his faith. This year, we had the assistant deputy minister at our conference and I asked him if he knew Ken. He says, of course I do. At Monteith, I've met him several times. And I can tell you he's not shy about speaking about chaplaincy. In August 2019, Ken received the Corrections Exemplary Service Medal Award. One of the highest awards you can receive after 20 years of service. He genuinely loved being a chaplain. And when I spoke to him, um, when he was ill, he gave me a call and we spoke, and I said, so, um, you know, you're taking some time. He says, I would like to come back next week. Again, not determined, not stubborn, determined. And um, he said, but the doctor is not allowing me to come back. I said, well, can take some time. Um, and he talked about returning to chaplaincy. I tried talking to him. Um, at age 75, is it 75, right? He said to me, I got about three more years left, and then I'll start thinking about retirement. Did not want to quit chaplaincy. Um, he was affectionately called Brother Ken by the chaplains. Um, and here are some of the words that they sent to me. Um, the chaplain from Kenora Jail, Chaplain Steve, he said, I was always impressed with the amount of programs Ken taught at Monteith and his passion for the inmates there. He will be greatly missed. Chaplain Kevin from Thunder Bay. He said, I met him last year at the conference and he was a pleasure to meet and get to know. I am proud to call him my brother in Christ. The chaplain from Penitanguishin. He said, how beautiful must be the glory that Ken now sees. For he is in a better place. The chaplain at Brampton, the youth chaplain at Brampton, said, I'm saddened by the news of another soldier passing on, but God knows best. He's always said, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. From Chaplain Jeff in Thunder Bay, he said, Ken was a fellow credential holder and a close Christian brother. His loss will certainly be felt by the folks who knew him. I believe with all my heart that Brother Ken is now with his Lord. Crystal from the Brockville Jail said, it is with great sadness that I read this news about Ken. He was a blessing and a blessed child of God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Chaplain Danny from North Bay Jail, who came and substituted for Ken while he was off. He, he said, may the good Lord bless your family. In serving there, I could tell that Ken was well-loved. Well-loved, especially by the inmate, by the inmates and the staff. Chaplain Marvin, who I think you met last year, um, from Ottawa. He said, it's an honor to, be, to meet both Ken and his wife at the annual chaplain's conference in Hamilton last year. We were able to spend an evening together at a local restaurant to encourage each other. And I know Ken will be greatly missed at Monteith. The chaplain at Sault Ste. Marie says, thank the Lord for the hope and the promise that is his timing. We will be together again, Ken. The chaplain from Napani, he said, it's an honor to serve alongside such an amazing chaplain, Ken Glode, in corrections. I was impressed by his passion and compassion for the work he did. The chaplain at Milton, 
said, I think it's obvious to everyone, even those who did not meet Ken, that he was loving and well-loved. Chaplain Cheryl from Toronto. She said to the Ken Glodes, to Ken Glodes family, sorry for your loss, but rejoice where he is. One of the four great chaplains in World War II, Chaplain Poling, he said to his father as he was boarding the ship to Dorchester, he said, don't pray for my safe return. That wouldn't be fair. Just pray that I shall do my duty, never be a coward, and have strength, courage, and understanding of men. Just pray that I'll be adequate as a chaplain. Our job as chaplain is to love those. Love those without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. And that was what he demonstrated. When I took this job, I knew certain parts of my role would, you know, um, would have some political aspects to it. I'm not a good politician, still not a good politician. And I remember talking to Ken about this um, just when I got into the position. Like, I really don't, I don't see myself as a, politic, as, as a politician. I can't do politics very well. And he said to me, the task ahead of you is never as great as the power of God behind you. I took that with me. You know, when someone dies, we miss them. It's like learning to live with an amputation, a part of your body. We recognize that the Glode family will never be the same. There is that human part that is missing. I heard a story, and I close with this. Ken and I, we, we, he, he, he told a lot of stories and got me into telling stories. And I read a story, I like to read stories about the, the hymns and how they evolve and what is the story behind it. And there's a story about a little girl named Cheryl who she would come to church every week and they had that role that they would check off. And if, if someone attended and never missed any week, they would get a prize at the end of the year. Little Cheryl was quite an avid attender. She did not miss Sunday school. But one week, Pastor Black noticed she wasn't there. And he marked her absent. And he says, I got to go and see Cheryl because she's never been missing. And the next week, she wasn't there. And he marked her absent. He said, for sure, I, am, I do have to go and see Cheryl. The third week, she wasn't there. And he said, okay, after church, I am going. When he went there, the mother met him at the door. With tears in her eyes, she handed him a note from Cheryl. She said, Pastor Black, Cheryl passed away a few days ago. With tears in his eyes, he stumbled out. He went to a park nearby, sat on the bench, and opened the note. And it said, Dear Pastor Black, I know when you called my name, on the roll, I was absent for the last three weeks. But when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. He turned the letter over and penned the words to that famous song. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. While he is absent from this earth, we should rejoice. Because when the roll is called up yonder, Ken is there. Thank you so much for the privilege of sharing in this celebration of life. When I lost my mom, I was angry for a while until a pastor friend sat me down and said, rather than being angry, Frank, why don't you be grateful for the time you've had with her? So I say, rather than be sad, yes, we will be. I am grateful for the time I've had to share time and space with Brother Ken Glowed, and you should be too. Thank you so much. Well, what an honor it is to get to share a little bit today. 
Uh, my name is Jason Small, and I'm with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And so that's the larger family uh, that Frank was a part of. Uh, <laughs> so as Frank, he's part of our family now, too, that Ken was a part of as a credential holder with us. And uh, across Canada, we represent um, somewhere uh, around uh, 3,000 uh, credential holders. And Ken served with excellence. When Carl and I, my wife, we first got into ministry, uh, memories of, uh, of, of Ken and Joanna. So we started out, we were just these rookie pastors. And we're coming to this community called Inglehart, just south of here. And so we went to Inglehart and, and we, were just, uh, we were just beginning. We didn't know a whole lot. 21-year-olds um, uh, excited to move to northern Ontario. And I remember the first conference we went to, we were super nervous. And they had this breakout session for all the sections. We didn't even know what section we were a part of. And Ken invited us to his table, the Cochrane to Miskaming section. I thought that sounded like such a weird name. I didn't even know that was what we were a part of. And I remember having dinner together, and they just encouraged. And, and him saying that he was available to help if we ever needed help. And so uh, as young rookies getting started, uh, one of the things, we just didn't have a lot of resources at our church. And, and if Carl and I wanted to go away, uh, on a holiday, there just wasn't uh, a lot of resources and there wasn't uh, somebody to, to kind of fill the gap. And, and uh, we'd used a few people from town. And actually, this is a bit of a weird story. So every time Carl and I, we had an age, aging congregation at the time. And so the first time we went away, someone from the church passed away. The second time someone in the church passed away. The third time someone in the church passed away. And people started to say, don't go away. <laughs> like... <laughs> Bad things happen. And, uh, and so on the fourth time, we were looking to try and find someone. And uh, we met with Ken at the conference. And he said, oh, I'm available to serve if you ever need somebody. And so we called. And he came down and served. And I remember the people said, no one died. Get him back. <laughs> and and uh, he is just such an encouragement in life uh, to so many. He's been a blessing to, uh, to the prison and, and to all those connected and, and a great chaplain. But, but more than that, he's actually been a voice uh, across the region. His uh, heart and the fingerprints of what God has done in and through him reside in many of our churches across Ontario, Quebec, and, uh, and all around, he's been a voice that's been steady, faithful. As young pastors, uh, we, we got to know this, not just because no one died when Ken came to speak, but also because when he was there, I never had to worry as a pastor. He's filling in. I know it's going to be with excellence. I know it's going to be a word from the Lord. I know our people are going to be encouraged. I know that they're going to be inspired and they're going to be inspired to be better people in the community around them. And that's the heart in which he led. As I later became the Northern Regional Director and, and would call and, and Pastor Ken would go to far-flung areas and they would serve. And Joanna, you've been faithful in this too. And, and, and Timmons uh, Congregation, you've been faithful to allow him to go and serve in so many contexts around. His heart and his hand has been all over. Someone said, it's not what you do, it's what you put in motion. And I think through his life, he has put so many good things into motion and impacted so many congregations, so many people's lives all across this north. What a blessing. I know as the superintendent, to have people like Ken is, is literally gold as a superintendent their lives, their faithfulness, uh, the, the low drama, just faithful to serve with what God's called them to do and to make a difference wherever they go. I was thinking about these words um, from Thessalonians, and it says this, uh, 
because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. And I think that about his life. How he lived among you, not for his sake, but actually he lived his life for your sake. He was a blessing and an example everywhere he went, not, not, not to puff himself up, but actually lived his life with a deep conviction over the call over his life. For me, that inspires me to live differently. For me, there's a hope that, that someday I could leave a legacy like he has led. He's been a faithful, faithful credential holder for many years, been a faithful, faithful pastor, minister, chaplain, faithful with the call God has over his life. And so we honor him today. Good morning. I originally wrote something to honor Pastor Ken that best reflected my relationship with my mentor, my teacher, my friend, and my youth partner. However, the Lord began to stir something new in my heart this week. And so I'm obeying as this best reflects and honors Pastor Ken as the servant's heart that he was. So I'm going to share Matthew 13, verse 1 to 23 with you out of the message version because that's what Ken loved to teach in. So it's about a harvest story. At about that same time, Jesus left the house and sat on the beach. In no time at all, a crowd gathered along the shoreline, forcing him to get into a boat. Using the boat as a pulpit, he addressed his congregation, telling stories. What do you make of this? A farmer planted seed. He scattered the seed, some of it fell on the road, and birds ate it. Some fell in the gravel. It sprouted quickly, but didn't put down roots. When the sun came up, it withered as, just as quickly. Some fell in the weeds. As it came up, it was strangled by the weeds. Some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Why tell stories? The disciple came up and asked, why do you tell stories? He replied, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. Not everybody has this gift, this insight. It hasn't been given to them. Whenever someone has a ready heart for this, the insights and understandings flow freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity soon disappears. That's why I tell stories, to create readiness, to nudge the people toward a welcoming awakening. In their present state, they can stare till doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. I don't want Isaiah's forecast repeated all over again. Your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. The people lack understanding. They stick their fingers in their ears so they don't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. So they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. But you have God-blessed eyes, eyes that see, and God-blessed ears, ears to hear. A lot of people, prophets, and humble believers among them would have given anything to see what you are seeing, to hear what you are hearing, and never had a chance. The meaning of the harvest story, the study, this story of the farmer planting seed, when anyone hears of the kingdom and doesn't take it and doesn't take it in, it just remains on the surface. And so the evil one comes along and plucks it right out of that person's heart. This is the seed the farmer scatters on the road. The seed cast in the gravel in the gravel is this is the person who hears and instantly responds with enthusiasm. But there is no soil of character. So when the emotions wear off and some difficulty arrives, there is nothing to show for it. This seed cast in the weeds is the person who hears the kingdom news, 
But weeds of worry and illusion about getting more and wanting everything under the sun strangle what was heard, and nothing comes of it. But the seed cast on good earth is the person who hears it and takes it in the new, and takes in the news and then produces a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. So the reason that scripture has been stirred at has been stirred within me is to identify which condition our heart's in when we receive seed deposits. Pastor Ken, as the farmer, invested in each and every one of us. He prayed, he shared the gospel, he was generous, kind, loving, and compassionate. He, de he demonstrated it through his daily living. He walked fearless. He was never short of any stories with the life he lived and used it. As a, as a living testimony of what Jesus did for him. A lifetime of miraculous stories that the youth will cherish and remember for years to come. Pastor Ken deposited seeds in people's lives. This is why we are here to celebrate him. He always said to me, Jocelyn, the work in ministry isn't always noticeable right away. The harvest comes after a period of time and the work also never ends. Just like the parable in the scripture, some fail in their faith, some stay for a season, but when seeds of faith in Jesus take root in good fertilized soil, the Lord blesses that harvest for generations. I believe we are going to continue, continue to see a harvest in Ken's multiple ministries. Ken remained faithful to his calling at Monteith, here at TPC, and in his home. He was extremely giving, a model, a mentor, a partner to be cherished. It was a privilege to serve alongside him in youth ministry. Thank you. I can hardly believe that I'm doing what I'm doing here today. God bless you. My name is Pastor Terry Grimes, and I've had the distinct pleasure and honor of knowing Ken and Joanna and the family since 1974, when Ken first began his journey with the Lord. I met them in the church in Cornwall when we were pastoring there. I am credential with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada for the first 40 years of ministry. In the last 10 years, I am credential with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Newfoundland, where I am presently living with my wife and family. And I extend to Joanna and Christian and Jan and, and Kelsey. And uh, where's Heather? There she is over here. And all the Globe family are sincere condolences at your loss and ours. And I'll share just a little more, but I want to add a, just a great big amen to everything that everybody has said up here about Ken. And uh, I, there wasn't a single lie that was told up here today. Amazing, amazing man. And I'm so honored, but just a few moments before the service began, Joanna says, I want you to do something for me. She said, I want you to lead in singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My great Redeemer's praise. I think Ken would be absolute thrilled to hear you as a congregation sing this from the depths of your heart. This hymn is over 200 years old, but it's as fresh as if it was written yesterday and a powerful, powerful song indeed. So I'm going to invite the congregation to stand and together we're going to sing from the depths of our heart, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. For a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad, 
the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music to the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. You blame, behold, your Savior come and leap you lame for joy. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given. My saints below and saints above, Christ the earth and him. Love the verse number four, if you would be so kind as to sing that again. How appropriate is that verse in ministering huh, what Ken has done? He breaks the power of cancel sin. Ken saw that in the lives of so many inmates. He sets the prisoner free. Is that appropriate or what? What a great verse. Come on, with all your heart, let this one ring out. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the fowls clean. His blood avails for me. Hallelujah. God bless you. Well done. You may be seated. <laughs> as the as the baby of the family, uh, my uh, dad always accused my mom. <laughs> of letting me get away with anything. <laughs> and uh, she said, he always told her that she would defend me right to the death. Um, so I asked my mom how much time I had to do this. And she said five minutes. And I told her I needed about 45. So I'm sure dad's just thinking right now, here he goes again and getting away with whatever he wants to be doing. So it's exactly what I'm thinking. But um, my mom, my sister, the rest of my family, We'd like you all to thank you for coming to the celebration of life for my dad today. And I always say, you know, as I get up here to speak, this is what my children always come to see all the time. They always know that when dad's up there preaching, he's going to cry. Um, so it's the only time that they're all making sure that they're all paying attention. But I've been to a few funerals in my life and uh, only recently have attended a celebration of life. And I think the celebration of life term that we have here is just so much more fitting than to call this a funeral. My dad placed his faith in the Lord. And because of this faith, he lives today. For all of us that are believers, this is a time of celebration. My dad, he wouldn't want people to come to a funeral and be sad about his passing. He didn't want things to be somber. He always wanted this, his passing to be a celebration. He wanted, he wanted lively music. And he would have been the first one to remind us that he isn't dead, but he's instead still alive with his father. Paul tells us so in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, I say, and we prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. For the believer, this is the ultimate hope that we have. If you are here for a funeral, you're about 60 years too late because that's how long ago my father died to sin and became a new creation. That's when he truly became alive in the spirit. So while we'll miss his physical presence, let's celebrate. And let's not only celebrate his physical life, but let's also celebrate his redeemed life, a life that's now fulfilled in his hope in Christ. 
One of the most amazing things about our Lord is that he has a divine plan. My dad lived in obedience to that plan. He was obedient in being the father that the Lord designed to lead our family. And I'm not saying he was a perfect man. He wasn't a perfect father. He wasn't. But he was a redeemed man. Only one perfect man has ever existed, and it wasn't my dad. But he had two defining attributes that were perfect for our family, two important characteristics that's had a great influence on my life. Now, you might be thinking, I'm thinking of the, or talking about the manly things that only a father can teach a son, like how to fix things. I can tell you right now, <laughs> he didn't teach me how to fix things. My dad was not a skilled fix-it man. And although he was a lover for the power and strength of duct tape, <laughs> he fixed most things with duct tape. He loved duct tape. And again, he used it to fix everything. He found uses for it that you wouldn't even thought of. And he also used it to identify every piece of luggage and backpack that he has ever owned, decorating the outside of the bag so it would either distinctly be identified as own at the airport or too ugly for anyone to want to steal. <laughs> He loved duct tape of every color and design, and it was his go-to tool for fixing everything, and that's not one that I've embraced. But no, fixing things isn't the legacy he passed on to me. Now then, you might be thinking that I might be talking about fishing then, and he did like fishing, but no, you'd be wrong. He didn't teach me to become an expert fisherman. Yes, he taught me how to put a worm on a hook and throw it in the water, but no one would ever accuse anyone in our family of being skilled at fishing. We are a family of lucky fishermen, but definitely not skilled. And Pastor Paul, you would probably agree with that assessment. <laughs> what I did learn from my dad, though, was the two most important things that he could have taught his family. First, he taught me to love the Lord, and second, to love other people. So let's talk about the first one. My dad loved the Lord. He loved God's word. He loved to pray. He loved the gospel. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He was a servant. And I pray someday that these words will always be said of me. I'd be say hard to say that I'd be hard pressed to find anyone here who wouldn't bear testimony to my dad's love for the Lord. The fact is, he was never going to stop preaching and teaching. He was willing to do anything to further the gospel. <laughs> He handled the seriousness of the gospel with all the respect and seriousness that it deserves, but he also had no problems being silly and outside the box and leading children's and youth ministry. Although he didn't live to see retirement, retirement would have ended his desire for ministry. It would have just opened a new opportunity. My dad understood the importance of the work the Lord called him to do. And it wasn't just work that he did. It was work for the Lord late Tim Keller describes earthly work this way. Everyone will be forgotten. Nothing we do will make any difference. And all good endeavors, even the best, will come to naught. Unless there is a God. If the God of the Bible exists, and there's a true reality beneath and behind this one, and this life is not the only life, then every good endeavor, even the simplest ones, pursued in response to God's calling, can matter forever. What my dad did mattered because he did it for God's glory. What my dad did, he did because of his great love for the Lord, his faith in Christ, and the finished work of the cross in redeeming his sin. Although he ran from his calling early in his adult life, his obedience to God's calling has had an impact on many gathered here today. And I am confident that this obedience will matter forever if not just for the eternity that he will spend with our Savior, Jesus Christ. The second thing that I learned from my father was how to love others, even people that on the outside seem really hard to love. It's easy to love family and friends. It's even relatively easy to love those sitting right beside you here in church. What about those that have really messy lives, have lots of baggage, or don't know the Lord? My dad was able to find ways to insert himself into those messy lives all of the time. It wasn't something that I think was even overly fluid or easy for him. I think that he had to work hard to connect with many of the people that he came across. But he was able to find ways 
that gave him inroads into real relationships with hard to reach people. His probing questions could catch you off guard, but I learned much too late that he was just making connections. Bruce, you reminded me of this, but he would often say things or make a statement about something that would immediately generate the thought, what are you talking about? Or there's just no way that you really think that. But then conversation would start and he would go from there. He truly loved people and he was always able to find ways to connect. And he did this everywhere he went, whether it was here in Ontario or in Nova Scotia or in Saskatchewan and Quebec. My parents made connections everywhere they went. They just loved on people. And he showed me through his actions what love looked like. He taught me how to rightly love my wife, love my children. As a child, I never heard raised voices in our household, never any harsh words towards us kids. This wasn't the product of him having a great childhood. He certainly didn't have a storybook childhood. But instead, his love can be attributed to the transforming power of Christ's love in his life. And it was on display in the way that he loved us. I saw firsthand his love for my mom. And I try to love my wife the way that he loved my mom. I'm confident that my daughters will have the same expectations of love for their future husbands because of his example of true love. So it is with great sorrow that we will miss my dad's presence in our family. But with great, great joy, we celebrate the love that he shared for all of us. Over the past few months, as I've had the opportunity to get to know many of you here in Timmins, I've heard so many firsthand stories of how my dad's love and friendship touched many of you deeply. The outpouring of love that I've witnessed in this community from my parents has reminded me that although I'll go home to North Carolina, my sister's gonna go home to Nova Scotia, that the family and body of Christ that has loved my dad and mom all of these years will continue to love my mom in his absence. I can't thank you enough for that. I want to close with a special memory of my dad. As I was thought about what stood out to me the most about my, over my lifetime with him, you would think that maybe I might be thinking of something from my childhood, such as him cheering me on at football games, and he did that, and it was impactful. But I'm convinced what I will cherish the most was reading the Bible to him the last few days of his life just so glad I had that opportunity. It sounds so simplistic. But of all the things that I will remember, it will be having an opportunity to bathe my dad in his time of need in God's word. Because that's what he did for us as we grew up to be servants of God. I'm thankful, Dad, for your life and example. And looking around at all these faces in front of me right now, I know the work you did for God's kingdom really mattered because of your obedience to God. Absolutely awesome job. Tremendous. What a man we're celebrating here today. What a gift Ken Glowood has been to the church and to the world. I am so proud of my two adopted children, Heather, Christian. I have two adopted kids who are at home who loved Ken with all their heart. They would say, Dad, one of the first things, one of the greatest things we remember about Ken is he taught us how to scribble. And he would say, it's scribble time. We went through more coloring books because he said, you got to learn how to color outside the lines. And Ken lived his life outside the lines. He wasn't boxed in. It was amazing the impact that he has had upon so many, many lives. And certainly upon mine. Today, I travel Newfoundland with my camera. And Ken has been a major, major influence upon me in that field. I've chosen it as my hobby of retirement. 
And when I get old enough to retire, I'm going to do a lot more to good Lord willing. But it's a pleasure to see Ken's pictures. And before I left home yesterday, Heather said, uh, Terry, she used to call me pastor, but she'd given up on that. And she used to listen to what I say. And I had to stop her the other day and says, Heather, you're getting very bossy. You're telling me what to do. And Joanna said there was a time when she wouldn't talk to you like that. But she gave me a pair of Ken's running shoes, size 10. I looked at him and said, Heather, these are very, very big shoes to fill. So every time I wear them, I will be challenged to color outside the lines. <laughs> but I want to read my responsibility, my honor, my privilege today. And thank you, Joanna, for giving me this opportunity to be able to share the word that Ken loved so dearly. And my duty here today is to share with you, I believe, what Ken would share with you if he was standing here. And I'm taking you to two different portions of Scripture, beginning in Psalm 116, and then I'm going to move over to the New Testament and share the testimony, final testimony of the Apostle Paul. And both of these apply so powerfully to Ken's life. The psalmist David in Psalm 116 and verse number 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious, highly valued, treasured, something to be desired. Precious in the sight of the Lord. We live our lives from beginning to end in the sight of the Lord. And regardless of what others might feel or think or say about us, when we live our lives with the realization that we are in the sight of the Lord, it should challenge us, and I believe Ken knew everything about that. Living his life in the sight of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I had to stop there. His is a possessive pronoun belonging to, and certainly we can easily see by the testimonies that we have heard here today from family, from friends, and from co-workers that Ken had no problem whatsoever letting someone know that he was his. The servant of the precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Sometimes we use this word saint and we give the impression that a saint is this perfect individual who never sins, who never does anything wrong, and we hold them in, in very high esteem, and so we ought if that's who they are. But this word saint doesn't mean a person that's perfect, as Christian just mentioned, with regard to his dad. I think Ken would be a little upset if we stood here today and pretended that Ken was perfect. He would stop us quickly and let us know that, that he wasn't. He wasn't perfect, but a saint is not a perfect individual. It's an individual who was being perfected by the Lord Jesus Christ, by who owned him. He belonged to the Lord, and Ken would dearly love to share that. And the psalmist goes on to say in verse 16, O Lord, truly I am your servant. Servant has got to be one of the outstanding words that describe Ken and his life. He loved to serve the Lord and to serve people. He had a servant's heart. When we were pastoring in Cornwall and in Prescott, Ken was working with us in, in ministry. Ken was attending the church there in, in Cornwall. And when we went to open the church in Prescott, Ken and Joanna came and joined with us. And what a tremendous help. We had a church. Our church was in the gym. And we had to put out the chairs. And you know all about this. This is where, 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 you, where you are down in the States. We had to bring, Every Sunday, we had to pull out the chairs, bring our, bring our pulpit with us, have pulpit, we'll travel. And Ken was there involved in every aspect of that ministry. And he loved to serve the Lord. I remember one evening we were in the midst of a Bible study. And here's, here's Ken's readiness to serve. We were in the midst of Bible study. And a sudden emergency arose that I had to take care of. 
And I was in the middle of the Bible study, and I'll be perfectly frank, but try not, uh, I had to use the washroom. And I needed to go. So in the middle of my study, I said, okay, now uh, Ken is going to come, and he's going to pick up here on my notes. My notes are here on the pulpit, and he's going to come and take you through the next two steps, and uh, and uh, he'll he'll pick up the study, and uh, and I'll be right back. I left the platform. Ken walked up out of the congregation, picked up my notes. When I don't know what he said because I wasn't there. Probably spent most of his time correcting my theology, what I had said in the first half of the Bible study. And he uh, walked back down to a seat, and I picked up, and the congregation had no sweet clue. It looked like it was something that we had planned for months. But Ken was always ready to serve the Lord. And the psalmist here says, and the last part of that, Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. How true is that of Ken at this particular moment of his life? These physical bodies that we live in sometimes can hold us down. But Ken has come to a place in his life where the Lord has loosed his bonds. He set him free from the bonds of earth and Ken presently living in the presence of the Lord. Now I take you to 2 Timothy, a great place to pick up here where he's loosed my bonds. Because the Apostle Paul is here in prison in Rome. And Paul knows that his time is near. And so this is what he says to the young preacher, Timothy. And it, it, it bears our listening to what he said here. What a testimony Paul had in his life. He said, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. I am already being poured out. What a description of the way Ken Glode lived his life. He poured out his life. He said, I'm already a pouring out as a drink offering unto the Lord. Paul had given his life to serve the Lord. He writes in Philippians and he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I can easily hear Ken say that, can't you? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We don't look at death as something that's precious. I've been in the hospital and I've lived enough, long enough in Cornerbrook where the hospital is. And I pull over to the side of the road more times than I can recall when the ambulance is coming by and the lights are flashing and the, the sirens are going. What's that all about? Somebody doesn't want to die. Death is not precious to us. It's separation. It's a loss for us of those that we love here but in the sight of the Lord. Why is it precious in the sight of the Lord? Because one of his children is coming home. One of his children has been loosed from the bonds of earth. One of his children is no longer going to experience sorrow and pain and tears. You have children. When your children come home, Christian and Heather are not living with Joanna and Ken anymore. But when Heather and or Christian, come home. Joanna is filled with joy. Right, Joanna? <laughs> she just smiled. She never, she never confirmed it. Yeah, that's true. But there's joy in the hearts of parents when their children come home. And when the child of God goes home to the heavenly father, it's precious in the sight of the father that their, their child has come home. And now Paul here is saying the same thing with regard to his life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I can't say for me to live is Christ, I can't say for me to die is gain. But what a beautiful combination. And then Paul goes on to say, the time of my departure is at hand. I walked through the airport in Toronto just a couple of days ago. And I noticed some signs above. One sign said, arrival. And the other one said, departure. Every one of us in this room, we, ha we have a time of arrival. January the 19th, 1948, Ken Glode had an arrival. 
September the 8th, 2023, he had a departure. Ken had no control over either one of those. I didn't get to choose when I was going to be born. And I don't get to choose when I'm going to die. But between my arrival and my departure, I've got a lot of decisions to make. Ken made more decisions than probably we could ever begin to dream in the midst of his ministry and just in the midst of his life. And I am confident that every decision he made wasn't a good one. But he made many, many marvelous, wonderful decisions to live for Christ and to live for people. He lived his life in such a marvelous manner. He did not have control over when he was going. Right up to the last few days before Ken passed into the presence of the Lord, he still wanted to go back to work. He still wanted to, he was, sort of, he was going back to work. He was still doing sermons when he was in the hospital, getting ready to go back to, he loved what he was doing. And if Ken could have done it, he would have stayed here, even though to depart is, to, is far better. But he just loved what he was doing for the Lord. And he was going to do it as long as he could. He said, for, for the time of my departure is at hand. When Paul wrote those words to the young preacher, Timothy, there was three things, three pictures that would be in the minds of this young preacher, Timothy. Number one, it would be a picture of a soldier. The word departure is a picture where a soldier has been out on the battlefield and he has been fighting fiercely in the battle. But the battle is over now and the Soldier has won the war. He's taking down his tent. He's packing up his gear and he's going home. Ken was a faithful warrior of the cross of Jesus Christ. And he's departed to go home. It would be a picture of a farmer who's labored hard out in the field in the hot sun. But evening has come. The farmer has taken the yoke off of his oxen. And he's gone into the home to be with the family for the evening. Ken labored well in the work of the Lord. But now his labor is done. And he's gone home to the family. The family of God that he's a part of. And lastly, it will be a picture of a sailor who has had a cargo to deliver. He has delivered that cargo faithfully to the port. He's loosed his moorings. And he's now sailing home. Ken had a responsibility. Ken had a plan that was God's plan for his life. Ken fulfilled that as we look in just a moment. He fulfilled that and he's now gone home. He sailed home back to his Lord and creator. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. Not necessarily a good fight. When I was going to school, even in kindergarten, oh, I wore glasses. Anybody wear glasses when you were in school? Like, like eyeglasses, these things, I mean? When I was in kindergarten, I was one of those nerds that always came home with a Band-Aid between his eyes with the, the glasses that got all busted up because I was in a fight because somebody called me four eyes. I never considered a fight to be a good fight if I lost. But if I won, I thought, that was a good fight. <laughs> I got Ken won. He has fought. William Barclay in his commentary on the New Testament said, every human being is a walking civil war. The flesh wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. The plans of men war against the plans of God. And every human being is a walking civil war. But when the war is over, Ken was able to say, I fought the good fight. Why is it good? Because he's won. I've often heard people say, you know, so-and-so, oh, they, they lost their battle with cancer. When a child of God goes home to be with the Lord, there's no way, shape, or form you can call that a loss for them. A loss for us, absolutely. But, oh, what gain for them. Ken can say, I fought the good fight. He fought, he fought against the things that were coming against him in the flesh. And he's won. He's with the Lord. I finished the race. It's one thing to finish. I mean, it's one thing to start well. 
But it's another thing to finish well. And when you look at Ken's life story before us, Ken was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was born with a tremendous disadvantage. But Ken discovered God's plan, God's race, God's plan for his life. And he lived that life. He finished that course. He did what God had called him to do. And I believe Ken lived one of the most fulfilling lives any human being could live because he discovered God's plan for his life and he lived it out to the strength and the power of the Spirit of God. And he was faithful. The last part of it says, and I finished my race. I have kept the faith. Faithful certainly is another one of those words that absolutely neons the life of Ken Glode. He was faithful to his God. He was faithful to the word of God. And he was faithful to the God of the word. He was faithful to his beloved wife. He was faithful to his family. He was faithful to his purpose. What an example he would set for us. Oh God, that I may be as faithful. As faithful as Ken has proven to be to you. He goes on to say, I've kept the faith and finally... And I'm getting close to that finally that applies to this. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I have to stop at this. And there's a, a question that begs to be answered. What will be final for me? Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day. There is a crown. A crown belongs to a victor. During the times of the Olympics, when an athlete was a winner, he got a crown or she got a, She didn't because only men could do that then. <laughs> he got a crown that would fade away. It was a crown of, of leaves that would fade away. But the crown of righteousness that our brother Ken is enjoying is a crown that will never fade away. He's a winner. He's got a crown that the righteous God shall give. And we rejoice with Ken and where he is and what he is seeing and what he's enjoying. But then he adds this to it. And he says, but not to me only, but also to those that love his appearing. I think if Ken was standing here today, he would want to say to you, do you love his appearing? Are you looking for the return of Jesus Christ? As Ken lived his life, he was looking for the returning, longing for the returning of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm challenged with this. Jesus left us with this challenge. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Why? So that where I am, there you will be also. And I have to ask myself, are you prepared? For the place that is prepared for you. What an awesome, awesome eternity there is for the child of God who loves and serves the Lord. And Ken would say to us, it's just a little while. Oh, if you could see, if you could only see what I can see right now. What a joy awaits you as you prepare yourself for, to live for Christ now so that when that time calls, and he, the writer to the Hebrew says, it is appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. And some people get a little bit afraid of that verse, after this the judgment. But for the child of God, that's a judgment of reward. That is a Calvary has taken care of the judgment of, of our sin. But for the child of God, the beam of seed of Christ that Paul is talking about, that's a place of reward. That's a place of great rejoicing to know that we, it, as if it wasn't enough that Jesus would die for our sins. We still get a reward after what he's done for us. We live for him. I can't begin to imagine the reward that Ken is going to be enjoying when he stands at the judgment seat of Christ for the life that he's lived, for the ministry that he has shared with those that God has placed under his care. And so today, thank God for the gift of Ken Gloat. Thank God for all those seeds. Where is she? For all those seeds. There you are. <laughs> for all those seeds that Ken has sowed. And they're still flourishing. 
the petal has been dropped in the water and the ripples are continuing and continuing and what a reward we wait, awaits for a man as faithful as Brother Ken. And what a reward awaits you, child of God. Our world is growing worse and worse. But for the child of God, the ones looking for his appearing, we have got a fantastic future. And it won't be long. Joanna, it won't be long. Your separation time is brief. It'll seem long at times. But it won't be long before all the family is at home. The church terrestrial will become the church celestial, and we will be together with the Lord. And for that, would you just take a moment and let me pray with you. These young ladies are going to come, and they're going to sing for us in just a moment, but I just want to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. Thank you for the assurance that we have in our hearts that our brother Ken is in your presence and that we shall see him. Lord, we pray that you will keep us close to you. Lord, that we will be sensitive to the voice of your spirit and that we would live faithfully to you through the strength of your spirit, that you might be honored and glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, young ladies, as you sing. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me, love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. I am surrounded by songs of deliverance. We've been liberated from our bondage. We're the sons and the daughters. Let us sing our freedom. Oh, 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 oh. Split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. 
you rescue me and I will stand and say, I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me now, we'll stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me and I will stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Prior to Pastor uh, Terry coming to do the committal, I think it's important. I'm not sure if the sound was missing for that, but uh, the song was sung at the bedside of Pastor Ken. And at the end of the song, when that phrase was said over and over again, Pastor Ken, unable to speak, pointed to himself saying, I am a child of God. So it's important to know that. Pastor Terry, would you come? What a great testimony. I am a child of God. If you can say that and know the reality of that, you not only have a good handle on today, you have a good handle on the future. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. We're going to do a temporary committal here today, and the earthly remains of kin will be given to the family, and it will be taken to a, a permanent burial place at a later date. So let me ask the congregation if they would stand with me, please, as I read the word of the Lord for you. The scripture says, We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
For as much as it has pleased Almighty God to take unto himself the soul of our dearly beloved Ken, we here commit his earthly remains to be later buried at a place prepared for it, that ashes may return to ashes and dust to dust, and the imperishable spirit, refined as by fire, may be forever with the Lord. Let me again pray with you. Father, I pray for the family, especially today. We uphold them, Lord, before you. And we pray, O oh God, for family and friends of kin who are left behind. Lord, that we would constantly be reminded of the challenge that his life has given to us. I pray comfort and strength and peace to the family, Lord, as they face the days and weeks that are ahead for them. Lord, we know that you will be there for them. Holy Spirit, that you will be there with them. But Lord, we pray that you would surround them with friends and family, those that will be an encouragement to them as well. And Lord, we pray that as we look forward to that day of sweet reunion, that we will be faithfully serving you by the example that Brother Ken has set for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. I just remind you that everyone is invited to the fellowship hall for a time of refreshments following the recessional. And the recessional that you are going to hear has been chosen by Ken, and uh, appropriately so. And it's entitled, When the Saints Go Marching In. And Ken was making it clear that, uh, as, as uh, Christian said, I don't want a funeral. I want a celebration. And this song is certainly a song of celebration when the saints go marching in. So as this music is played, we will encourage the family to make their way, and we will meet you in the fellowship hall upstairs.